everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Amanda Hare. I am the Marketing and Public Relations Manager for Vulcan Park and Museum. And today as a part of our exhibit, Birmingham Bottling, Soft Drinks in the Magic City, presented by Birmingham Coca-Cola Bottling Company. We have with us today, Mr. Dennis Smith, author and collector who has written extensively on the soft drink history of Birmingham and beyond. Two of his books, Coca-Cola in Alabama and Cola Wars Birmingham, reveal a city in the thrall of the beverage industry in the early 1900s. Another, Diva Brown, recounts the story of Brown's attempt to use a stolen formula to beat Coca-Cola in the soft drink game. In this Facebook live chat today, Dennis will discuss the strange soft drink brands that popped up in early Birmingham and the sometimes stranger people that were behind these brands. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to today's speaker, Mr. Dennis Smith. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Amanda, for having me. I grew up near Ensley between the mines and mills that built Birmingham. As a kid, I grew up listening to family history, first from my 12 year old grandfather carrying a gun in the shooting war that brought the Mine Workers Union to Alabama before 1910, and up to my father's place in integrating the skilled trades at United Steel's Fairfield Works. As a kid, I started digging and collecting old bottles. I wondered about the odd soda brands, Ryola, Wyzola, Nova Cola, Celery Cola. I wondered why they weren't around any more and, and who, who were the people who came up with these names, these odd drinks. Started researching these brands as a kid in the Southern History Department of the Birmingham Public Library. Archivist Dr. Marvin Whiting was a tremendous help, was my mentor in learning how to research, learning what materials were available, learning how to take care of these fragile documents that held the history I was looking for. Years later, as an adult following degrees in history and archaeology, I started to put some of my research in print. Like my own family history, I found the personal stories of the people involved the most interesting part of the story. The people in the soft drink history were, were not isolated from mainstream Birmingham, but they were rather heavily involved in the city where they staked their lives and fortunes and where, where, where they lived every day. They were, it wasn't an isolated segment of society. I'm gonna speak briefly about some of these individuals. Let's see, it's not sharing my, is that sharing my screen? I'm at, okay, great. First, Pete Hooper. He was a bachelor who in 1891 purchased a half interest in Birmingham Steam Bottling Works. The steam had, name had to do with an indication that it was a modern mechanized company as opposed to done, all the work done completely by hand. It had a steam engine running the equipment in order to carbonate the water and create the soda. So, in 1891, he joined Sam Worcester as partners in the Birmingham Steam Bottling Works. He was active in society. He was a member of the Birmingham Carnival Society back in the 1890s when Birmingham actually attempted Mardi Gras. In 1897, he was chosen as master of ceremonies for Birmingham's second carnival. He served a number of years as a police commissioner in Birmingham and spent 17 years in the bottling business as a partner in Birmingham Steam Bottling Works until he di died at home in 1908. Next up is James C. Mayfield. He was a native of Randolph County, Rock Mills. In the 1880s, he was a partner with the inventor of Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Dr. John Pemberton. He was the one who actually worked with Pemberton closely and was taught the formulas for Pemberton's various medicines and beverages. When Pemberton died, Mayfield became president of the Pemberton Medicine Company and also continued in charge of the manufacturing. 
That company changed to the Wine Coca Company in 1894. Wine Coca was another of Pemberton's beverages. The Coca-Cola name had been sold to other people in Atlanta who started the present day Coca-Cola Company. So they could use all the formulas, but they couldn't call it Coca-Cola, which was a trademark of the other firm. Mayfield came to Birmingham in 1899 after promoting wine coca in Boston and New York City. In 1899, Mayfield Celery Cola was the first cola to be bottled in Birmingham. From his Birmingham headquarters, Mayfield established branches across the United States. He traveled between his offices and a private rail car. He was also involved in local issues. He was one of 200 businessmen who signed a letter opposing building the new terminal station, saying it was too far from town and, and it, it would, wouldn't be useful. He also signed a letter in the Birmingham News supporting the Good Roads Movement and describing the plight of manufacturers trying to get their goods delivered out of the city. Mayfield even used his political influence with US Senators Pettus and Morgan get his eldest son's desertion from the Navy changed to an honorable discharge. Mayfield's son-in-law, Oscar Hayes, was born in Jasper, Alabama, the son of a judge. He was a child prodigy. At the age of 10, he was a page in the Alabama legislature. He was an officer in the Alabama National Guard and served during the war with Spain. He was an honors graduate at the University of Alabama and Tulane Medical School and on graduation with his medical degree, came to Birmingham to set up practice and was named to Birmingham City Physician. His father-in-law, Mayfield, gave Hayes the Birmingham Celery Cola bottling plant as a wedding gift in 1907. Later, Hayes moved to Denver where he served as city physician. He was inventor of a number of things, including a gas-saving carburetor, which we could certainly use today. Later, he served as Summit County, Ohio coroner and sheriff. His father-in-law in his later years moved to Akron and li lived with his daughter and son-in-law. And between the two, Hayes and Mayfield, they were heavily involved in the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s in the Midwest. Hayes Birmingham celery cola plant got caught up in a sting operation. The U.S. Department of Agriculture Bureau of Chemistry charged them in 1909 for a violation of the pure food law. Government experts in a trial in Birmingham Federal Court testified that celery cola contained enough cocaine and caffeine to kill a five-year-old child. The four principals, including Hayes, were found guilty and given the maximum fine under the pure food law, $25 each. Other defendants were, were prominent local men. One was James Hawkins, who was a clerk of the circuit court. These were the people who were involved with the drink at the time they were under attack by the government. Another person involved in local soft drinks was E.A. Fox. He was an insurance executive based in Atlanta who moved his business to Birmingham in 1903. At the time, he was making $6,000 a year, which in today's dollars was an annual salary of $200,000. He gave that up to take over the celery cola business from James C. Mayfield. They actually met in the lounge of the Florence Hotel and got acquainted. That was where businessmen gathered at the end of the day, out of town businessmen to, to get acquainted and do business. Fox took over the celery cola business and rented an expensive ground floor office in the new Birmingham City Hall. Rather than operate the bottling himself, he hired people to do the bottling and the delivery as a separate contract. Fox was also a speculator in Birmingham real estate. And he was involved in local affairs. He was president of the local order of American mechanics, which was at the time, I originated as a racist organization trying to trying to get away with Catholics and blacks and immigrants. 
Celery Cola's most expensive advertising expense purchased by Fox were celluloid notepads with this picture on the cover, which is what is shown here. The manufacturer called the note on this purchase and Fox couldn't pay. The company went, bottling company went bankrupt and Fox left town without notice and owing money. On a more positive note, Crawford Johnson was a clerk, oh, excuse me, I'm too many. Bear with me a moment. Here we go, sorry for the delay. Robert Johnson, he was a circuit court clerk in Chattanooga in 1900. In February 1902, he bought the Birmingham Coca-Cola plant established a year earlier by Atlanta Mint. Thanks to Johnson, the firm experienced tremendous growth and expansion, creating many jobs in, in Birmingham and surrounding towns. Johnson's plant became the largest Coca-Cola plant in the US by 1911, thanks to his hard work and management invested in other Coca-Cola plants across the South. Johnson was well known among Coca-Cola bottlers and well liked and was selected as master of ceremonies at the first Coca-Cola bottlers convention in Atlanta in 1909. Johnson was one of six bottlers across the country chosen to serve on the advisory committee for Coca-Cola bottlers, advising the managers of the parent company for policy and helping bottlers grow their own business. Johnson was directly involved in selecting the first and second standard bottles for Coca-Cola. Locally in 1915, Johnson became president of the Birmingham Chamber of Commerce and brought the finances into such a good shape they avoided bankruptcy. In 1917, Johnson was appointed state director for war bonds by President Wilson. In 1923, he organized the Birmingham Community Chest, now known as the United Way, and became its first president. As far as his relations with, with his competitors in town, he once loaned his manager to the Chiricola bottling plant when their manager had a weeks long extended illness. George Wackensley, he was a native of Missouri, he came to Birmingham from Indian Territory, which was before the state of Oklahoma was admitted. Indian Territory, he ran a newspaper there and came to Birmingham where he had family friends from his youth, the Davis brothers who already had bottling plants in Birmingham and Bessemer. Wagonsler started Pratt City Bottling Works and on the bottles he used an Indian image inspired by his time in the West. David Earl Moody was formerly a circuit clerk in Etowah County. In 1903, he bought an interest in the Celery Cola Bottling Works. He served as a traveling salesman. Here he is with his valise, which contained his samples and probably a change of shirt and socks. He was later manager of both the Birmingham and Bessemer plants. He also, with his father, ran a patent medicine venture in Birmingham. He later moved to Aniata and became a farmer and later was elected circuit clerk in Blunt County. Greek immigrants, Nick Coleus and Chris Jubilis had a large wholesale produce business in Birmingham. In 1904, they added the Bottling Works and they called it Alabama Bottling Works in honor of their adopted state and even used what was then the state seal of Alabama as a trademark and embossed on their bottles. Diva Brown, originally Diva Mayfield, she married J.C. Mayfield, mentioned earlier in the 1880s at Roanoke. She was with her husband in Atlanta in the late 80s when he was involved with Coca-Cola. They divorced in 1897 and Diva determined to make her living selling soft drink extracts and formulas 
across the country. In 1898, newspapers across the U.S. declared Diva Mayfield one of the successful women of the South, which is certainly unusual for a Southern woman in the 1890s. She was briefly married to a Judge Brown in New York City in 1899 and came to Birmingham and uh, again was on her own for several years. She came to Birmingham in 1907 and at first she sold a formula to Birmingham Steam Bottling Works for a soft drink that they named Dope and had it trademarked under that name. Diva soon was working with the Alabama Grocery Company who, who later developed Buffalo Rock. At the time, she helped him with a drink called Lime Cola. In 1908, she had an office in the Brown Marks building and was soliciting business by letter across the South. She billed herself, as it says here, as the original Coca-Cola woman. A neighboring office was occupied by Jay Budwig, a brick manufacturer, the Budwig Myers Clay Manufacturing Company. A romance developed and Budwig left his wife to become Diva's third husband. Budwig financed the creation of the My Coca Company in Birmingham in 1909. The firm's advertising featured the likeness of Diva Brown and the words made from the original Coca-Cola formula based on her first husband's connection with, with the inventor. In 1911, the Budwigs divorced and Budwig took control of the company after a lawsuit in city court. Diva moved to Savannah and died in 1914. In the 1890s, Mamie Mustin, owned 997 out of 1,000 shares of the Iron City Bottling Company. In, in, in spite of the fact that, that she owned essentially the whole company and, and managed the affairs, she could make no decision for the company without written consent of her husband, Robert, who owned one share. Mary Jones was a black woman who established Eagle Bottling Works in West Highlands in 1908. She actually had an eagle on the bottle. A number of the local bottling companies had designs on them that were more easily recognizable. I, I suspect that, that there was a significant portion who had little education and a picture helped them identify the drink they were looking for. Another minority owned business was Camel Bottling Works owned by Alan Harris. Well, there were two early companies in Birmingham that were owned by minorities. Amanda, I'm looking to unshare my screen. I'm not finding the link at the bottom. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Okay, at th this point, I want to see if there are any questions from the people logged in to watch. Yes, so feel free if anyone wants to unmute and ask their question, or if you would like to drop your question in the chat, I'm happy to read it out for Dennis for you. I haven't had a chance to see the exhibit yet. I'm living in New York and it's, it's quite a drive. So hopefully I will be down that way in a couple of months. Has anyone yeah. ever seen the exhibit yet? Now, I know I see a couple of folks from Vulcan that I know have seen it, so they don't count. <laughs> oh, sure they do. <laughs> I mean, it lo looks like a great exhibit that Phil and his team put, put together. I'm looking forward to getting there in person. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine based on looking at the script what, what the whole Lynn Henley room filled will look like. Yeah, Phil did an amazing job um, put, putting together this exhibit with our team. So I'm super excited. I can't wait for you to come by and see it in person, Dennis, if you get a chance. Oh, hopefully in a couple of weeks, I will be down that way. 
Oh, I think we have one question. Um, have you found any descriptions of the flavors of some of these drinks, especially celery cola? Well, well, there were a lot of flavors. Prior to 1900, most of the bottled drinks were flavors like lemon, orange, root beer, ginger ale, and uh, a lot of other flavors. They even banana, and there were some early Pepsin drinks long before Pepsi Cola got started. Celery Cola, from what I found, was actually made from the original Coca-Cola formula with extract of celery added. That's what I found in the court records from my research. There were a lot of different celery drinks, some were like a ginger ale, there was a celery cream soda, there were celery root beers, but celery cola was actually a caramel colored carbonated dr drink with, with the addition of a little bit of celery, not, not a strong amount, but just enough to make it a distinct taste. That definitely sounds interesting. <laughs> well, it, it, it told well, well enough that from the time they opened in Birmingham in 1899, within five years, Mayfield had made enough profits that he had purchased 4,000 acres of oil lands in Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, had a number of producing oil wells. He, he put that in, into other businesses and investments. He passed enough money on to his son who built a large compound in Beverly Hills and the grandson built a mansion on, on the beach in Long Beach, California. So, so it, it was a profitable business and celery coal was actually sold into the early 1930s. That the business was no longer headquartered in Birmingham, although they had an office up until about World War II that, that was staffed by Mayfield's eldest son, the former Navy deserter. Awesome. Are there any other questions? Um, any information on a Peter Hubert partner named Smiley that appears on an embossed Hutchinson style bottle? Oh, yes. E.J. Smiley. Yes, he was actually, I believe, an employee of Hubert before he, he bought out Worcester. Actually, in late 1905, Birmingham Steam Bottling Works at that time owned by Hooper and Worcester ran into some financial difficulties. Worcester sold out and afterwards Smiley bought his portion of the company and it operated from 1906 to 1909 as Hooper and Smiley as they put on the bottles, but the company was named Birmingham Steam Bottling Works. In 1909, they reorganized, I mentioned earlier, where Diva Brown sold them a formula for a drink they trademarked as dope. Well, in 1909, they renamed the company the National Dope Company and operated under that name for two years before becoming again the Birmingham Bottling Company. But they operated under that name up until about 1920. And Smiley was involved for a number of years into the teens with the company as it changed names. Awesome, awesome. Are there any other questions? I have a comment. Is that why some older people call soft drinks dope? Is that the reason? I just remember in the past, I've heard some older people refer it to as dope. Well, as one of those older people, I remember as a kid of five years old going to the store in the neighborhood and, and hearing someone come in and ask for a dope. Okay. Back in the beginnings of the cola business, dope was a common name for it because in the early days, it actually had cocaine, celery cola, and other drinks had cocaine and caffeine and other harmful ingredients. That, that was one of the reasons for the Pure Food Act to be passed in 1906. And it took years. There were actually other Birmingham companies that were involved in a sting operation out of New Orleans, but where the Bureau of Chemistry agents had this company, the Finley Dix Wholesale Drug Company, order soft drinks samples from several companies. Celery Cola was caught up in this, Wiseola, 
Riola and a couple of other Birmingham companies and some in Atlanta as well that sent samples and these samples were taken from the freight depot, never opened, and taken to the Bureau of Chemistry lab in Washington, D.C., where they were analyzed and lawsuits eventually made against all of these companies for having harmful ingredients in violation of the Pure Food Act. But in the er early days, do dope was a common word in the Southeast. You get to the Southwest, it was more likely called Coke, with, with a Coke implication, just like cocaine. It is for cocaine today. Th there's records from going through the lawsuits where people testified the full testimony is available where people would go and order a Coke, a dope, a shot in the arm, wanting a soft drink, a morphine cocktail. In Atlanta, where they were building the first skyscraper to be headquarters of the Coca-Cola company and named after the company president, Issa Candler, it was frequently heard for someone to walk into a soda fountain and say, give me a brick in the Candler building. <laughs> Okay, we have a couple of more questions. Um, was the number of drink companies typical across the South and the US? Well, there were more soft drink companies in the South than in, in, in the North. The, the South was, was more a static population. In the North, there were considerable immigrants. The Italians came in with the preference for, for wine, Germans and Irish for, for beer. Uh, it, it was just an entirely different culture, and, and the South had less of that and soft drinks, especially with, with the temperance movement, which was led by the churches. The churches were strong in the South 100 years ago, just as they are today, and, and, and the, the churches riled against alcohol, saying drink soft drinks. In fact, a lot of these publications were actually funded by advertisements from the soft drink company. At the same time, some of these soft drinks had cocaine, caffeine, and other harmful ingredients in them. Okay. And so we have another question. There oh, were more sorry. soft drinks, and all, all, all the popular soft drinks were invented in the South. Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Pepsi in North Carolina, Dr. Pepper in Texas. Seven Up, a later one, came out of St. Louis. Some of the other smaller drinks, Double Cola, New Grape, they were all Southern drinks. Okay, so we have a few more questions. Are any of the buildings that once housed the bottling operations still around? There are a, a few still around. A, a couple I have looked up and, and wondered about if they are these original buildings. It, it would take some time to check because a lot of these companies moved around. The, the Coke plant that Crawford Johnson bought in 1902 what was quickly, it quickly his business expanded far beyond the, the capabilities of that location. He built a brand new building. He, he moved into in 1904 that was supposed to be sufficient for a decade. And three years later, he had to move to a larger building. So after he moved out of that building, the Celery Cola Company bought it because it was ideally suited for their business. And when they moved to a larger building, another soft drink company moved in, in there. So some of these buildings were around for a long time, but it, it, it would take a check of city directory locations to, to see what may still be in existence. Okay. Um, is there any Birmingham connection for Big Tom bottling out of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas? Is that similar to Big Chief? I, I'm not familiar with the Big Tom brand. The, the Big Chief brand is one I've been trying to get information on. It wasn't a Birmingham drink, but there were a number of bottlers in Alabama that bottled those flavors. It, it was uh, sold in a number of different flavors, typically in a bottle with, with, with uh, Indian Native American on the, the bottle. And it was predominantly sold by Coca-Cola bottlers. So I'm trying to find the connection there. But the big time I'm not familiar with. Okay. And we have another question. This one came in from Facebook. Are there still bottle machines in Birmingham? Uh, bottling machines? Well, Coca-Cola and Buffalo Rocks are, are a couple of the, the largest 
bottling companies in, in the, the South. Now, if you're referring to bottle manufacturers, very few of the bottles used in Birmingham were actually manufactured here. They, there was a bottling works at Gate City, what, what is now near a Porto Road in Irondale, outskirts of Birmingham on the east. There was an operation in the early 1890s for a few years, but that's the only glass plant that was actually located in Jefferson County. So the bottles weren't made here. They were made by companies in, in the, the north and east and shipped here often boxcar loads at a time, 30 to 40,000 bottles packed loose in barrels and delivered to the bottling plants. Okay, awesome. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, well, if there are not any more questions for um, Mr. Smith this evening, I would like to thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to, to chat with us about the history behind bottling. Um, I invite everyone to come out to see our exhibit inside the Lynn Henley Gallery here at Vulcan Park and Museum. It is on display through January of 2023. So, and we also have another Facebook chat. We will chat with Larry Thornton on February 23rd at 6 p.m. as well. So uh, come back same time, same place in, in about three weeks. I'm sorry, two, two weeks and uh, we'll do this all over again. Thank you so much for your time, Dennis. Thank you all for joining us. And I hope that everyone has a great evening. Thank you, Amanda.